Welcome to the Military Justice Today podcast with your host, Robert Capovilla and Mickey Williams, covering the full range of military law topics from all branches of the armed forces. Today's episode is made possible in part by the law firm of Capovilla and Williams. And now, let's welcome the hosts of the show, Rob and Mickey. All right, everybody, here we go. Another episode of Military Justice. Today, I'm Matt Starosiak, and in the studio, we have a PAC studio today. I think this is the only time we've had Rob, Mickey, and Dan all in the podcast studio together. So welcome, gentlemen. Happy to be here. Thanks, Matthew. And look at Mickey Williams. He's chiseled these days. Thanks, Matt. You look, are you are his biceps chiseled. a little smaller, though? I don't know. Well, let's get out the measuring tape. I'm willing I'm willing to put it on the table. I told Mickey that you called him scrawny the other day, which led to Mickey taking his shirt off in the office and flexing for you in a photo. Yeah. So let's <laughs> not kind of let's not do that today. Uh let's avoid doing that in the podcast. My man who was challenged. Well, it's great to see you guys. We've got a phenomenal episode uh on tap today. We've got we're con- we're, we're privileged enough to have a very special guest, Kevin Peden. He's the co-owner of Peden Digital Forensics and really one of the foremost experts in this area nationwide. He's a, a colleague and a friend of the firm, and we're thrilled to have him on today's episode. Kevin, are you with us? I am. Good morning, all. Good morning, sir. Great to be with you. Thank you so much for taking the time. We're excited about this episode. Uh, you kind of know the routine because I know you've listened to to the podcast before. We're going to do a brief introduction. I'm going to make an attempt at a brief introduction of your background and your credentials, and then we'll get down to business as usual. Um, so you've been doing this uh, digital forensics for over 20 years, and you've been involved in more than 500 general court marshals federal cases and state cases during that time period. And I was pretty amazed to see that you've actually testified in more than 200 cases, which is a phenomenal number. You've provided training to the Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps, as well as a large contingent of civilian attorneys around the country. And uh, and before this, you were a law enforcement officer for more than 17 years. So just uh, an incredible background, incredible credentials. And what I will tell you is that Robert Capavilla is always generous with the compliments he gives out to people who perform well in a courtroom, even if it's the opposition. But I can tell you honestly, I don't think I've ever heard him talk more favorably about a professional and an expert than he's talked about you, Kevin. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, the fact of the matter is, is I think I can speak for Mickey and Dan um, as well when I say this. There are soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen that we've represented over the years that are walking around today as free men uh, based in and due in large part to Kevin's and Carol's work. And uh, so when I speak highly of Kevin, when Dan speaks highly of Kevin, when Mickey does, it's because um, whether he's working on the government side or the defense side, he is the best, and he will uh, dedicate himself to finding out the truth. Um, but Kevin, enough of the love fest uh, for you and for your company. Um, I want to just educate our readers, a lot of or our listeners, a lot of our, our veterans, a lot of them are active duty service members, a lot of them are JAG officers. But when we talk about digital evidence, what actually are we talking about? When you hear digital evidence, what does that mean to you? Well, basically anything that's recorded on a digital format, like a computer, a cell phone, an iPad, uh, possibly a watch, even potentially a car, um, anything that records data in an electronic media is digital evidence. So even camera cards that you'd like to use in your vacation pictures, uh, storage, thumb drives, all that kind of stuff is all digital evidence. So we've got a bunch of defense lawyers in this room. And I know you do just as much work for the government side as you do the defense side. And I know your wife, Carol, who's your colleague in your in your company, who's also a digital forensic expert. I know she works a lot with the government, but we got a bunch of defense hacks in the room. And uh, one of the things that I want to talk about is one of the challenges that we all have as defense lawyers in today's day and age is if we believe that there's if we find out there's evidence in a sexual assault case or something similar on an accuser's phone. 
it's become really, really hard to get that evidence. You've dealt with this in every branch uh, across the DOD. You've dealt with this. Uh, you've worked with dozens and dozens of lawyers about how to effectively go after evidence that might be on an accuser's phone. Just edu- educate our, our listeners a little bit on what advice do you have for those folks, whether they're accused or they're, or they're the defense attorneys, when we find out there's helpful evidence that we don't have on the accuser's phone, what should we do? What should that client do? Well, you know, that's a, that's a great question. Um, one of the things, you know, that people have to understand is that as a society, as people, we do not communicate verbally anymore. We communicate everything through our electronic media. So, you know, if you're talking to your wife, to your kids, to your best friend, or to just colleagues, it's probably through a digital format of some sort. Um, and so when we have sexual assault cases, it is very common to have data that's important to your case on the um, the complainant's phone. And so how do we get that? Is it important? And are we doing a phishing expedition? And so the courts want to know that. And if you're going to try to request and get their phone, you have to be able to justify how you're going to uh, get what you need for your case. And yet uh, the rights of the um, complainant are protected. And so what we've found is when we do digital extractions of devices, which is collecting that media, um, we can do that without looking at any data. And then we can uh, isolate a very specific range of data that we're looking for. So for example, if we're looking for just pictures, um, I can look through the pictures. But if I'm looking for a picture that was taken on a very specific date, I can do a timeline of that exact uh, range of date and time when this is supposed to happen. And if there was a picture taken, it'll show that. I don't have to go through all of the other pictures. Um, And so the courts, we've had many examples of this where the military courts um, have issued uh, protection orders, uh, which limits the scope of what we look for in practice. Um, Sometimes we do an in uh, for the judge so that they can confirm that it complies with the uh, with the protection order. Um, and other times we just provide it to the attorneys. Um, and of course, obviously, you always have, have the, the risk of running into something that was in that restricted time that's outside that, and then you have to have contingencies for that. But so, Kevin- by getting that protection order, it gives us a lot of information. Let's assume for a second that uh, we're working a case together. Um, you work closely with our firm. We file the production motion to have the alleged victim's uh, information, uh, their, her, her text messages or, or communications with our client. The judge says, you know what? I'm going to issue the protective order, but I think this is necessary and relevant. I think this goes to the client, the heart of, of the defense's case, and we win the motion. Um, at that point, what happens the alleged victim is it better for the defense attorney to say hey i'm okay with this with this phone being sent to cid ncis um you know or or god forbid sieges right um or is it better for the defense attorney to argue and say hey listen this phone needs to be sent to our digital forensic experts for analysis what what thought process do you have with that certainly what the, what we really recommend is is that we do a joint extraction. So, and I've done this in many cases. I just flew over to the Carolinas to do an extraction for a CID uh, case that's in out of uh, Washington, uh, an Army case, where I actually went that down. I allowed the uh, um, CID agent to do the extraction, but I was there watching. So it was a joint extraction, um, and. If you have uh, a regular forensic person on that's not CID, NCIS, OSI, um, we've done them together as well. That way, both both sides get a copy of the exact same thing. There's no questions. There's no, um, you know, er- everything is in, on line with that order uh, from the court. 
Now, I'm going to turn it over here to the um, lion of military justice, Daniel Higgins, in a few moments, known internally also as the Blue Jay. But I do have another question. Affectionately known. Affectionately known as the Blue Jay. Um, But I do have another question for you before I do that. Uh, And this is kind of a general question. We hear a lot that in today's day and age, evidence cannot be actually deleted from a phone or a computer. Um, talk to us about that. Can evidence actually be deleted? Are there times where the information is just gone? There are times when that is ha- that does happen. So it can it can uh, be deleted or overwritten um, if the person on it is intentionally trying to eradicate it. There are programs that will overwrite the data, and it also depends on what media you're looking at. So on a computer, it's much more likely that it will remain for a long time where on a phone because of the way that their data is stored um, it can uh, disappear quicker on a phone but it's always a potential that it's still there hey kevin this is dan happy to have you on man um you know i I want i really want to highlight your capabilities um as a digital forensic expert because you know, I recently did a court martial with you, and I feel like you were instrumental um, in, in really shaping our defense. And you know, there were large amounts of metadata in our case that I would not have been able to understand. Right? I am not an expert on on digital forensics, obviously. So, for you to come in there and and help us out there, I felt was instrumental. So, you know, one of the questions that Rob asked, you know, talking about uh, an extraction, how you do that. In our case, they were actually able to send you kind of a copy of the evidence directly to you, so you didn't have to do the joint extraction with them. Do you see that happening often? Is that rare? That's that's actually the the norm. So basically, the way the process works is we're usually brought on after the case is initiated, which means that law enforcement has collected evidence. Uh, It probably has been extracted and it has been evaluated by a digital forensics expert for the government, Um, whether that's me being hired for the government or whether that's DC3 or the FBI or or, uh, Homeland Security, and they'll do an examination. Then when I get on board, they will provide me a copy of the digital evidence. Now, uh, these forensic images are best, the the courts have, have equated them with the best evidence rule. So, they will suffice in the place of the actual uh, device itself in the courts. And so they're an exact copy. Um, So when they send these, there's no way that they could be altered. They're they're protected and and double checked by hash values, which is a digital fingerprint to say that it hasn't been changed. So we have no issues with the government sending us copies of them um, when they do that. Right. So you'll be able to see the fingerprint um, in, in its original form, you, you know, and so for, I guess from a defense perspective, you know, when the government's case rests on, you know, whether the accused uh, possessed or knew of, you know, some sort of file, you know, on their device, you know, how, how can you help when you go in there and you look at a phone, a tablet, a computer, you know, when you're going in there to look at this metadata, can you see if the file has been opened, viewed, accessed, sent you know, modified in any way. Can you talk about that? Yes, I can. Absolutely. Um, a lot of times you can tell if it's been opened or accessed. Um, knowledge is, is is a very key portion of, especially if you're in contraband cases when you're talking about uh, images of uh, child abuse. Um, how did the person know it was there? Could it have gotten there without them knowing it? Um, could it uh, uh, have been accessed where it's located at? These are all really, really, really important questions. And it's the, it's the downfall of the government's case a lot of times. What we see in the government's cases, they see an image that's a contraband image and immediately let's go to court. They're going down. This is their device. So that they had to know about it. And the vast majority of the time, those images are found not stored by the user, not collected, not accessible to the user, and there's no evidence that the government can show that they actually ever saw them or knew that they existed. 
So you're um, able you're able to basically and, interpret, you know, looking at this metadata, you're able to interpret that and kind of help us shape our defense. Is that right? Right. It, and it's not just necessarily metadata. It's it's where they're stored. Right. So, for example, what we're seeing in this day and age right now is a lot of uh, cyber tips from cloud storages. So uh, Dropbox, uh, Google, um, Snapchat, uh, all of these different uh, storage cloud solutions. Um, they're, they're, they are mandatory reporters. So they have to send these into the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So basically, and it's the, possible to have. Yeah, no, I was, just, I don't mean to cut you off, but what you're saying there is, is the source of where it's found that speaks to potential knowledge or lack of knowledge. Is that what you're kind of getting at there? Oh, that's absolutely true. Okay. Um, you know, that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, even because you can have, like, for example, you can have things in your Dropbox that you didn't download, that you didn't see, and that you didn't put there. And right. I have this happen to me all the time, not when there's contraband, but with, for example, attorneys will send me their, their case files through Dropbox, and I'll download their case files to my Dropbox so that I can review them later. Okay? Well, I haven't gone through their whole whole archive of their case files, but it's in my Dropbox. And if there was contraband in there, it could be in there, and I didn't know it. Exactly. Now, God forbid that I don't ever want an attorney sending me contraband, but um, that's a, that's an example of how it could get there. Yeah. Well, what about you know the manipulation of evidence, right? Uh, you know, we live in a brave new world with AI uh, and the ability to you know Photoshop, use voice recognition, you know, type of things. You know, what about that? Are you able to identify you know uh, whether a, a photo or video has been edited or modified? To put a client, uh, you know, in a potential, you know, incriminating position, are you able to identify things like that as well? There are small things. Yes, there are small things to look for when you're doing those kind of things. Um, as a as an expert who has done a, a, a lot of different graphic work uh, with pictures, videos, and audio, you're looking for little tiny signs. Um, I had a case where. Um, in the background, you could hear somebody talking, and that talking mid sentence was abruptly cut off, um, and it changed. Right, so it's it's not possible humanly to, um, like, if you cut an audio segment in a video in an audio uh, recording, um, it doesn't stop immediately with a silence and then continue on without it. That's right. an editing. That's a, cl- a cutting of it. So you have to start and go through that and listen to it very closely with with uh, a lot of different uh, tools that we use to, to do that. The same thing with, you know, with images. You know, can you see blending of pixels? Um, er, Any more, anything is editable. And so what we find a lot of times is the government collects pictures off of people's phones and they airdrop them, which is not forensically sound. Um, they um, we'll have them email them uh, to themselves to the 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 complainant. They'll email it to the agent, or they'll text it to the agent. Well, there's a lot of data inside of those pictures that are critical to determining if they're authentic or if they've been edited, um, and that's called EXIF data. And so, when you have that data inside of there, you can go in and you can't see it on the picture. It's embedded inside the digital evidence of that picture. Um, and a lot of times, it, for example, if you Photoshopped it, it will tell me that it was actually edited with Photoshop in that data. Um, okay, but you so would you can not identify see it that. by looking at the picture. Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. And, you, you know, Rob mentioned this a little bit, you know, it, you know, things being deleted and are they gone forever, right? Can you talk a little bit about the difference between, you know, phones, computers, tablets, hard drives, you know, as far as you know, how, th- how long things last on a device when they're truly gone, you know, things of that nature. Sure. So on a computer, there, there's the, a computer is based on a hard drive that has a bunch of different uh, platters in them and it stores it electronically. When it's there, it's there. It'll stay there until it's actually overwritten by new data. And the way that it writes that data to those platters is not in any kind of logical um uh, process. So basically, it just throws, if there's a space on the data, it'll throw it there. Um, if it's a large file, 
it can only write so big. And so it will send it all over the place on that. And so it will stay on that drive forever and ever and ever until it's actually overwritten. Now, when you have digital, when you have uh, solid state drives, which is what you have in your phones, which you have thumb drives, uh, these are, this is a different storage process. It doesn't have the platters. And so it can only be overwritten so many times. Um, and it actually uh, will become uh, unusable over time. And so it can dissipate, disappear easier from them. Um, and on phones, everything's stored in databases. And so th- when the database, they can only be so big. And when they get full, they will start spitting out old data. And so it will actually lose data, even if you didn't delete some things, uh, because of the storage uh, allotment of that database. Yeah. And, and can you talk about that a little bit too, about the databases on there? I mean, say, you know, in a, in a practical sense, Mickey and I go commit a robbery and I capture this robbery on my phone, right? And then afterwards, I decide to delete that video That's from smart. my library, That's right? Smart. Yeah. Did, did Mickey threaten you to delete it or did you delete it on your own? Oh, no, I deleted it on my own. I, I would get rid of the evidence. So say say I delete it, right? Is it gone, gone? How does law enforcement go in there and then recover that video, right? Say, and, say, and, and we're excluding kind of the cloud. We're just talking about this local device. Sure. So. It, it more than likely would be deleted. However, there are all kinds of places that that's stored that are not in your photo gallery. So, for example, um, there's a thumbnail. So when you open up your, your phone and you, you see your archive of all of your pictures in those little thumbnails, that's a different database than the storage for those pictures. And so when you delete that picture, it remains in that database for the thumbnails. And you, and you wouldn't know it, you wouldn't be able to see it, and it could be recovered from there. So the fact that you have something in a database uh, in a thumbnail means that it was, it was viewable in a thumbnail view on your computer at one time, and it existed on your time, and it can be blown up. Okay. And so a lot of times I'll use um, a forensic microscope to blow up pictures so that you, because if you make a small thumbnail large, it pixelates where you can't see what it is. But if you use an enhancement tool, you can actually – take a picture of it and recreate that picture. So uh, there's ways to look at those small images that way. And they could look at it and get it that way, even though it deleted from your actual gallery. Yeah. And, and you know, you just reminded me of something, um, you know, when we're talking about these small images of like a cash folder, right? When, you know, someone is browsing on Amazon, right? And you could be looking for power tools, right? But you're scrolling through the results for power tools and maybe it recommends you know, lawnmowers down at the bottom. Well, you weren't looking for lawnmowers, but now isn't it true that all of the images that you saw on that page are now in your cache folder on your phone? That's exactly true. And and we see this charged over and over again. Um, there's actually case law uh, regarding um, what they call temporary internet files or their cache, their internet cache. And so basically the way that it works is every picture on a website is um, the little back button, the arrow buttons to the right or the left, um, any icons of whatever they might be, or the actual pictures themselves on the website are all cached. And they're cached even if they're not visible on your screen. Hmm. So it's possible. That's Let's say you go to um, Amazon and you're looking for blenders, you know, and you find the first one, the blend tech you want is on the top. But, you know, there's, 50 listed on the page and you have, you'd have to scroll all the way down to see all those pictures. Right. But if you just pick the top one, you buy it and you walk away, all of those pictures that were cat that were opened on that page that were present on that page are in your cache. So it's something that the operating system puts there. They put it there without your knowledge. You can't access them because they're, they're encoded. You have that special software, right? You didn't even see them. You never saw them. And, and so this is, you know, this is a, we, you know, we see it all the time in cases where the government says, look, they were looking for this contraband because there's pictures. Well, okay. Show me where, show me where web page this came from and what order did 
was it listed on the page? In other words, was it on the top image so that they had to see it when they opened it? Or could it have been the bottom where they may not have ever seen it? Because you can't prove how far you scroll on a web page. I think we saw a similar, or at least reminds me of the the very recent thing we saw with President Trump. And the, when they started looking into the background of that shooter, the original reports came out that he was researching other politicians or high-profile people. And then it was like a correction came out that said, well, that's not necessarily true. He was reading articles and the pictures of those people appeared. Is is there some analogy to to that? Um, it would be it would be a little bit different, but that doesn't surprise me. What we see most of the time, especially in high profile uh, crime cases, is that people spend a lot of time researching how to do what they're going to do. Um, you know, I had uh, I had I had a capital murder case where the guy spent over a year researching on silencers, and then we found the silencer being bought. The silencer was used in the in the crime. Yikes. Um, you know, so we were able to show that the pre plan had been looking for that. Same thing with like arson cases where mm. they 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 learn what's the best way to burn down my business, and they spend time researching that. So re- researching in the Trump case. Um, is not surprising to me because most people are not born with the innate uh, knowledge on how to commit such a, a, a an involved crime without doing some kind of research. And the internet is the way that they do that. Kevin, let's talk about that for a second, because obviously the, the attempted assassination of uh, former president Donald Trump has been something that's been all over headlines. Um, and uh, I know right now, and I'm just kind of curious to know myself that the FBI is, is leading the investigation into the shooter And there's been a number of reports that um, they're doing everything they can to get into all of the shooter's electronic devices. Um, You've worked cases with the FBI. I know that for a fact. Um, You've worked cases uh, against the FBI when when they're investigating a case and you work for the accused. What what steps is the FBI likely taking right now with that digital evidence? Um, and, And what would you expect or anticipate they'd be able to find? Sure. Um, Well, just take it off off offhand right off the bat. I have not seen any of the evidence, nor do I have any privy to what they're doing. Um, so everything I'm saying is what I think that they would be doing. Um, that being said, um, they would have collected the phones and the, the first and the computers that he had access to. Uh, that's the first starting uh, place. Um, they're going to get into them. Some of the phones you can get into, some of them at this point are still not accessible, depending on the models and the make of the phones. Um, but once they get in there, they're going to look for anything that he was doing uh, to educate himself or communicate about the, the crimes. Okay. So if he's talking with people online, if he's, if he's in forums, um, if he's looking for that, they're going to be looking for anything that potentially could indicate somebody else is involved. Um, and how, how long did he plan this or was this a spur of the moment? They're also going to look for any cloud storage stuff uh, because that is a big deal. Like, for example, if he was using Discord to talk with people or if he was using gaming sites, um, if he was practicing, uh, you know, video gaming, uh, this these types of scenarios. Because the people that he's talked to, they could go in, they could get search warrants and, and find out, get the logs of the communications and find out who he was communicating with in the game. Um, so it, it, it's something that's going to be a very long and involved process. It's not something that's quick. Uh, when you're talking about this, it could take, you know, years to get everything, uh, get through everything, but that's what they're really looking for. All right, Kevin, we've got about 10 minutes left, brother. And I want to do a little Q and a with you about, uh, some of the things you've seen in, in your court martial experience, because obviously, um, we deal with court martials every day. Um, and I don't know, I've not met anybody that's done that has actually sat through as many court martials as you have sat through. I think you're probably uh, the most experienced individual when it comes to actually watching court martials of anybody in the country. So I've got a handful of questions. I don't want you to think too hard about them. They're going to be kind of a, a quick hitting Q and A, okay? Um, and they're meant okay. to, they're meant sure. to be a little funny. But uh, number one, okay. what is the craziest or the most shocking thing you've seen that happened in a court martial? Wow. Um, well, I've done probably four or 500 court martials. 
Um, so I've seen all kinds of things. Um, I think that uh, one of the ones we were just working on was a was a homicide case um, where the the government spent a lot of time saying, you know, this is the shot that killed this guy, blah 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 blah, and then they actually found that bullet. It was the fifth bullet that the embedded in the floor of the apartment uh, that the guy lived in because he had accidentally discharged it well beforehand and the government was completely wrong with it. And they actually dug that up right in the middle of the trial and brought it in for the, for the jury to find you know, that, oh yeah, the bullet that killed him was in the floor and not even near the scene of the crime. So oh, that was, that was pretty funny. We, um, we know that what we deal with typically is is very serious stuff in a courtroom. But I'm going to ask you, what is the funniest thing you've seen happen in open court? Oh, um, wow, that one catches me off guard. I mean, and and it it can't be something see. about it can't be something about either Mickey or Dan or myself. Because <laughs> right now Mickey's wearing sunglasses in a room with black foam on the walls it's because bright, he's afraid of the he's afraid of the reflection. I, I, I spent a little too much time in the tanning bed, but it can be about me, Kevin. <laughs> okay. Well, I I can tell you that it it, it never fails when you know, one of the things that we see all the time is um, attorneys are really used to working with experts. And so a lot of times they forget to check with the expert um, during uh, during you know their case. So they'll have all their questions, and then they'll say, "Okay, we've come to a conclusion, or we've worked on you know with what we have to say without looking at their experts." So I had one attorney <clears throat> um, <laughs> that was going to um, <laughs> that was going to uh, uh, collect agree to uh, a collection of a victim's phone. And uh, I'm like, what are you doing? Stop, stop. And I'm, and I'm, I'm clearing my throat in the back of the courtroom. And I finally get him to look at me and I go, no, 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 no. We got to talk. We got to talk. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I saw this terror look in, in the eyes and went, uh oh. <laughs> you know, so it, it was pretty funny. Yeah. I, well, I, you're talking about me. I remember that. Um, <laughs> Is he talking about you or your sunglasses? Do you, can you actually confirm? Yes. So <laughs> probably both. So in that, I what happened was, yeah, there was an agreement. And I always I always say rely on your experts. Whatever they say you got to do because they, they're the experts. They, I don't know. I don't even know what I don't know. But anyway, so I'm there and we were supposed to have trial that week. And the judge... Uh, we ended up canceling the trial and litigated motions all freaking week long. It was crazy. And finally, we got the uh, the alleged victim to agree to turn over her phone, but only for certain uh, like dates or something like that. And I was like, okay, that that's only relevant to this case anyway, so let's do it. But then right before I agreed to it in open court, Kevin stands up just like he says. And he's got his fists on the, on the uh, gallery, and he's trying to get my attention. So I, I look at him. And uh, the judge is like, are you ready, Mr. Williams? Are you, are you guys, are you good with this? Is everything okay? And I, I look at Kevin, he goes, no, not everything's not okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I said, no judge, uh, we need a break. We got to talk about something. So yeah, that wasn't too long ago. That was what? I don't know. No, no, no. Five months yeah, ago. That or something. Was the, yeah. All right, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, that... Go ahead. Go ahead. No. And I, I, I just think that that's one thing that's really important for your, your, listeners to understand is is that while I may be an expert in digital forensics, I've seen 400 court marshals. I know what a psych's going to say. I know what a ballistics is going to say. I know what DNA is going to say. And I can look at, I can be there listening and you're, you should expect your experts to be there for the whole trial, not just their expertise. And so they can give you input, help with cross, help with the other experts. And it's not like I'm going to give psych expertise, but I'm going to say, you need to talk to your psych about this. This is a problem. You know, this is what you have. And, and they're not, people need to use their experts for, to the full extent of their experience. Um, and I think that would be real beneficial to your, your, your listening. And if I could add on to that just for one second, for anybody that's listening to this, that litigates cases, whether it's in military courts or outside of military courts, when you're cross-examining an expert, work 
with your own expert and don't go outside of the box because you are venturing in an area where that medical doctor or that forensic psych knows a hundred times more than you. And Kevin, I wish I had a dollar for every time we were in court and uh, the government starts cross-examining you off the cuff and they immediately, immediately regret it. Um, and so, <laughs> Rob, you talk about that case that you did with him a, a couple of years ago where you're like, man, did they ever make a mistake by oh, taking on my expert because the, his depth of knowledge was so much greater than theirs. It was a contraband case. And we actually had the, the father of the client at, in a podcast episode. And they the prosecutors were getting very frustrated um, that they it was not going their way. And they started to get off a little off uh, script with with Kevin. They started to get a little bit aggressive with Kevin and it really blew up in their faces because um, nobody knows this stuff better than Kevin does. And, and nobody knows it better than Carol does. And, and uh, Lord knows um, we we use him all the time. And it looks like Mr. Higgins uh, has uh, some final things to chat with you about, Kevin, before we close it up. No, just a comment. I, I okay. was just going to say that, you know, you, you mentioned cross-examination. And I remember in the, in the trial that we did, you know, Kevin helped me craft this, this brilliant cross-examination of their expert to where I got everything that I needed out of this expert and confirmed our defense through their expert, yep. right? The government and the defense, we had some disagreements about what the evidence was going to show. I got everything out of their expert, so I didn't even need to put Kevin up on the stand. We got it out through them, and that mm. was in large part That's to Kevin fantastic. and his help. Kevin, last question for you. Oh, wait, I got, I got one. I got one for him. Go ahead. Just real quick. Kevin, you mentioned earlier, this might be helpful to listeners. Um, you mentioned there are certain phones that the government can't get into yet. What phones are those? <laughs> <laughs> Mickey's going to uh, stockpile them. <laughs> they're, they're iPhones right now. Um, for a while, it was anything that was an iPhone 11 or older they could get into, but they couldn't get into newer. I think they're now up almost with 15. So 15 and up, they can't get into right now. Um, but before that, they could break into them. Okay. All right. So, know. so, so Kevin, I guess that's, you know, in a practical sense, if there is, you know, uh, photos, videos, something that the government wants on an iPhone, how do they get it? Well, if it's on one of the new iPhones, they're not going to. And what they'll, the only way that they can do it is they can put it in a closet and, um, hmm, interesting. and leave it for next couple of years until the technology catches up to it and they can get into it. Oh shit. That's almost um, like DNA. But that's, yeah, I mean, it, it really is. It's one of those things where they, they are constantly making um um progression on what folks do. but every time they do you know the the manufacturers of the phones make new uh technology that makes it more challenging <laughs> so just because they have a search authorization or a warrant to get into the phone doesn't mean that they actually can correct that is correct all right kevin last last topic for you we got four minutes before we got a close shop here how much money do I need to pay you to do a secret analysis of Mickey's media devices? Because I'm I'm <laughs> Why certain am I being attacked here? I'm certain that I if you I'm that. certain oh. that if you did that, Kevin, you would never be the same again. <laughs> what is that supposed to mean? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I'm clean I, as a I whistle. Can you, I can answer that in in a couple things. I would do it for free just for entertainment. <laughs> um, because I think that would be fun. And yeah. I don't know that you could warp me anymore because I've seen about anything that could possibly be seen, and I'm positive that <laughs> you need to come forward. Well, God. what about like what about okay? So you meant you meant I know we're we're closing out, but you mentioned that even if you don't scroll down the photos and so on, um, it gets stored in your cache on, on the phone or the computer, or whatever. What about like pop ups? You know, sometimes you know there's some websites that just have these advertisement pop ups. Will that also get stored even though you had no control over that? Any any website that opens up on your computer that has graphical data will be stored in your internet cache. 
Okay. Yeah, those are all pop-ups that you're going to find on there, Kevin. Just so. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet. Making, I bet. All right. Put this disclaimer out. But it's, an iPhone secret, 15 it's right a now. secret encrypted vault that I want to look at. That's right. <laughs> well, listen, Kevin, We uh, it was great to have you on. Just a, a wealth of knowledge and experience, obviously. But but let, let all of our listeners know, what's the best way to contact you if they want to take you up on your expertise, hire you for a case, consult with you? What uh, I know you've got a nice website, but what is the best way to get a hold of you or a couple ways to get a hold of you and your team? Well, our, our website, Peden Digital Forens- or PedenForensics.com, um, does have all of our contact information with both phone and uh, email address. Um, you can also contact me at Kevin at PedenForensics.com. Okay. Carol at PedenForensics.com, either one of those. Um, and, you know, we have no issues with, with discussing your case uh, prior to to see if there's anything we can help with. Uh, you'd be surprised on what kind of cases have digital evidence. Just about all of mm. them do. Yeah, I can't imagine. Um, so, I can't imagine. Um, I'm, I mean, we've done robberies and everything with digital evidence. So uh, it, it's amazing. what, what the, So, yeah, that's, that's the best way to get a hold of us. All right, perfect. And obviously, if anybody wants a reference, they've got uh, – Plenty of folks at Capaville and Williams that will let them know all that you've done for them and their clients over the years and hopefully will continue to do into the future. So uh, great having you on uh, the podcast today. We'll probably have you back, I would suspect. And uh, until that, best of luck in your endeavor. Just to all of our listeners, tune in next time. But for today, another episode of Military Justice Today in the books. Take care, everybody, and be safe. Thanks for listening to the Military Justice Today podcast with your hosts, Robert Capavilla and Mickey Williams. This show was made possible in part by the law firm of Capavilla and Williams. For more information or to listen to more episodes, visit militaryjusticetoday.com.